Welcome back. Uh, just as a FYI for everyone, we do have copies of all of the PowerPoints available on our website. So if you would like to reference any of the material that we covered today, you can click and download those presentations. We also will be posting the recordings following the presentation within the next couple of days on our website. We also will share it on our YouTube channel and you can keep an eye on our Facebook and LinkedIn for when those recordings will be posted and they're live. Our next presenter is Alex Bakken. Alex is a quality assurance specialist on our team in the local government division and has worked with our office for seven years. Alex oversees a wide range of projects, including preparing financial statements, auditing local governments, training staff, and assisting local governments with everyday questions. Alex graduated from the University of Oregon with a bachelor's degree in accounting, received a master's degree in accounting from North Dakota State University, and his CPA license. Welcome, Alex. All right, thank you, Emily. And good morning, everyone. Today we get to talk about everybody's favorite topic, the budget. Um, I have definitely over the past, I don't know, year and a half given a couple of presentations on the budget and kind of what, what you should be doing. Um, this will be a refresher for some of you that have already seen me talk about this um, in the past, but if you haven't, then I hope that at the end of this, you find some really useful information that you can take back to your organization um, and be able to implement this into your own budget. Before I get started, I did wanna um, just put a little blurb in here. My my kiddo, I have, a, I have a two and a half year old and he really, at the time when I prepared this presentation, he really was into turtles. Now he's into you know Mickey Mouse and trucks, but um, this is a, a clip from Finding Nemo here and in it, the, the large turtle there is telling the little turtle that, you know, you're, you're awesome, you totally rock. And that's really what I wanted to reverberate back to you guys today. I saw that on here, there is a lot of individuals from park districts, cities, counties, fire districts. And I really just wanted to say for myself and from those here at the auditor's office, that we know that your job um, can be very tough. You got a lot of things that you got to sift through and work through during the year. The audit process when we come in is just a short, a short time period that you gotta, you gotta deal with us. Um, but I just really wanted to say thank you to all of you um, because what the work that you're doing for your entities and your constituents, um, it's awesome. And so that's why I wanted to put this little, little clip up here. And so for today, what I kind of want to do is go through what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to go through the goals of the budget. I'm going to talk about some century code related to, to budgeting. I'm going to go through the um, file that we have on our website that you guys can use. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of areas of deficiencies that we've been seeing throughout the budget process, as well as give you kind of some tips and tricks at the end. Uh, now with that, what I, what, one thing I'm not going to do though, is I'm not going to tell you guys what you can or cannot budget on. That's you know really up to you as an organization but I am gonna tell you kind of what the various laws are surrounding the budget process. So a couple of goals of the budget that we've kind of identified here as an office is you wanna make sure that your budget that you prepare is going to meet the needs of your stakeholders. Um, the budget is really going to drive what you get to, what kind of services you get to perform for the, for the next year. So you wanna make sure that once you've gone through that budget process that it's really gonna meet the needs of your stakeholders. Make sure that the budget's supported. You don't wanna just throw numbers into a budget file as an estimate. We understand that, you know, that these budgets are estimates, but we still wanna have some kind of support for how you came up with those numbers so that you can explain it to your stakeholders if they come and ask, or you can explain it to us as the auditor's office or to your own um, auditor if they come asking questions. And then you wanna make sure that your budget is in compliance with laws and regulations. There's a lot of um, budgeting laws and rules out there. I'm gonna cover a couple today, um, but you wanna make sure that at the end, your budget is in compliance with those various laws and regs. So with that, 
I will uh, go into the a couple of the budgeting laws. Now, the next slide, there's going to be a lot of verbiage on here. So just kind of take that, know that that's coming, and I'll kind of work through those slides with you, um, give you kind of a brief overview. So what does state law require? Now, 112302, this is a century code for county auditors, um, and it, it talks about how for the county, you need to have a budget for your general fund, for each special revenue fund, and each debt service fund. Uh, one of the things you might notice as I go through this presentation is part of, uh, a lot of what I'm talking about is going towards the county budgets, but a lot of these things do apply to you if you're a park district or a city. Um, but some of these codes are strictly for, for county auditors. And in here, within each budget for your general fund, your, your special revenue fund, or your debt service fund, there's going to be various things, various elements that you need to have in your budget. Um, one of those is that you need to have a detailed estimate of your revenues for the preceding year, for the current year that you're in, and in the ensuing year. Same thing is with your expenditures. You need to be able to estimate what your expenditures are, kind of list those out, have a detailed list for the preceding year, the current year, and the, and the, and the um, upcoming year. And then you need to have transfers in and out budgeted for if you're going to budget or if you think that you're going to have transfers in or out during the year. And that, again, needs to be previous year, current year, and ensuing year. And then you need to have kind of an estimated fund balance so when you go through your the file that's on our website, the, the preceding year is going to be your actual numbers. They're not estimates. They're, they're actually what happened last year. The year that you're in, you don't have actual numbers, so you still kind of have to estimate what your expenditures and revenues are going to be for, for, the, for the year that we're in. And then you do the same thing for the upcoming year. And so when you start with that beginning year of knowing or that first year, of knowing exactly what your expenditures are and your revenues are, you're going to have a good spot for where your fund balance was at the end of last year, which is the starting point for the year that you're in by budgeting for those revenues and expenditures. For the current year, it's going to give you an estimated fund balance at the end of this year, and then that'll roll into what your fund balance is going to be at the end of the upcoming year. And then there is a spot here where it talks about cash reserve. Um, I am going to talk about that on the next slide, but or one of the, one of the next slides, excuse me. And the, it does talk about a 75% rule, um, but I'll get into that a little more here in a bit. Oh, one thing I did forget to mention on here, notice how for up at the top, it says general fund, each special revenue and each debt service fund. It doesn't talk about capital project funds. In GASB and in state law, there's no nothing that says that you have to have a budget for your capital project funds. You certainly may, but you do not have to. So I'll be touching on capital project funds at the end um, as how, how far you can use them um, in your budgeting process. The next century code that I'm going to talk about is 571531. And this is how you determine what you need to collect in taxes, what you're going to levy. And this applies to counties, cities, school districts, park districts, um, basically any municipality that can levy taxes. And what you're going to, what this law is stating is that in order to figure out how much you're going to levy, you're going to start with how much your appropriations are going to be for the year, what you want to um, spend the money on for next year. You add your reserve in, that kind of gives you the, your total amount that you're going to need to have in resources to be able to provide those kind of services. And then from there, you're going to subtract out what you have as your cash balance at the end of the year that you were in. So that kind of gives you your starting point as far as based on the cash that you have, what, how much more do you need to collect in order to provide those services? And you further will subtract that out by the estimated revenues that you had. Um, and that you want to make sure that that's going to be, you know, your state aid, miscellaneous revenue, charge for services, anything that you can think of where you're going to have a revenue source coming in. You want to make sure you budget for that. And then you would take that amount and subtract it out from your expenditures to see, again, wh where am I at now? What is it going to look like for the tax levy? Um, 
And then at the end, you can kind of add a estimated collection for tax levies because as we all know, you don't get 100% of what you're levying every year. There are, there are individuals out there who aren't able to pay their taxes, so then they get delinquent. So there is a, a piece in here where it allows you to have, a, I believe it's 5%, um, an extra 5% that you can levy just to make sure that you're covering, covering those costs. Then 57.15.27 talks about the interim fund, and this was what I was re referring to back on that 11.23.02 century code with that cash reserve, that 75% rule. Now, century code isn't necessarily clear, and there's no AG opinion on what the current annual appropriation uh, means. Is that the year that we are currently in right now, or is that the year that you're budgeting for? Um, but basically what it's saying is that you can have a cash reserve of up to 75% of what your current appropriations are going to be. As the office, we recommend that you don't go over 75% of your current, as in this year's appropriation, and you don't go over 75% of next year's appropriation, what you're budgeting for, just so you make sure that you are definitely in compliance with that century code. Now, all three of these state laws that I've been talking about. The file that is on our website, it's going to cover all three of these things. If you use the file, um, you're going to be covered with these three century codes. And so with that, I will, oh, no, I got a couple of other state law requirements here for those of you um, who maybe aren't a county. So for cities, it's chapter 4040. That's going to be talking about the budget topics for you guys. Um, 571501, there's a little uh, uh, rule in there that you can't like raise your taxes super high from one year to the next. So make sure that when you are doing your budgeting process and figuring out your taxes, that you look at this century code just to make sure um, that you're not in non-compliance. If you're a water district, there's a code there for you. And if you're other entities, you know, talk to your attorney, see what century codes out there that might apply to you. Chapter 57 really does have a lot of century codes out there um, that's going to apply to all entities. So take a look at that. Feel free to ever, you know, ask our office any questions um, if you have it. And during this presentation, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to submit them. And if there's time at the end, I will answer a few. If I don't get them to them this morning, we do have our question and answer session this afternoon. So we'll make sure we get to them at that point, but feel free to submit those questions as soon as they pop into your head. Uh, last piece there, there's budget amendments. There are various laws um, surrounding budget amendments. You wanna make sure that when you're, you know, you've done the budget for the year, now you're into the year, maybe there was some unknown expenses that popped up you needed to spend the money on we want to make sure is that if you overspent on the budget that the board comes back and does a budget amendment if you don't do the budget amendment then you're going to be technically overspent on your budget and there are some various entry codes out there that have said that the board may be joint and severally liable um, for those overspent amounts. You just wanna make sure, you know, during that first meeting in January that you have the board approve those budget amendments, you have support for them as far as why they happened, and that way no one will get in trouble. I've never heard of that law actually being used, but it is out there, so just so you guys are aware. So with that, I will go into the budget file. Now, we do have, I have the link up here at the top this one is for a county, but there is on our website a budget file for the cities, and then there's a budget file if you're a, another entity, another local government. Um, nobody has to use these files. Century code designates for county auditors that the state auditor's office um, is the one who's kind of in charge of the form and content. But that doesn't mean you have to use our file, it just means you have to have those items in your budget this if you use our budget you're going to be just fine i think to me this is a great tool um, i know we've gotten a lot of comments over the past few years that this has really helped entities out in their budgeting process now i don't it, this is an excel file but in this presentation i just have some screenshots so i'll kind of cover what some of these um, 
tabs are going to are going to be for the budget file. So at the bottom left, you'll see one that says budget laws. That's just going to have some of those um, budgeting laws that are going to be applicable to to your entity. The county budgeting laws will be in there. If it's a city file, there'll be some city budget laws. So some of those ones I've already talked about, but then there is more information in there that is not in this presentation today. There's a, a tab down there for budget file tips. It kind of just walks you through how to fill this file out, you know, um, gives you just some helpful tools and it'll make your process a lot easier if you if you check that tab out first. And you got your cover page. This is kind of what would go into being reported to the board, that first page. And then you there's a table of contents tab, a summary tab. And the summary tab is kind of nice because it lays out for you how much you're going to levy in each fund, how much property taxes you're trying to get. And then there is a tab for budget charts. Feel free to use it if you would like. It kind of will give you a pie chart, pie graph of where you guys are spending your money on for the year, what you budgeted for. Um, you don't have to use it though. We just put that in there as another helpful tool in the budgeting process. Then we kind of get to the main event of the budget file. Uh, the tab's called G1, but it just means general fund. Uh, up at the top there, we put, you would put the fund number. In this case, we put it as fund 1000, and then you can put in your max levy limit for counties. Right now that's at 60, unless otherwise approved to be higher. Um, by putting that max levy limit in, it kind of will kick in some formulas that we have down there at the bottom. That's gonna tell you based on what you've budgeted for, are you even able to collect as much tax as you think you're gonna need? It'll, it'll tell you if you're gonna be over your limitation. And kind of in the middle section there, that's where chapter 5715 is coming into play, where it's giving you the, the calculation of how you're gonna come up with your property tax amount. The top part is your appropriation and cash reserve. So the final appropriation is what you are budgeting for for your expenses. There's a line there for budgeted transfers out, and that gives you your total appropriations. And then line two gives you the cash reserve. Now for that cash reserve piece, over at the right side, we kind of have a calculation there for you. There's a lot of formulas in this file. So once you fill out your estimated expenditures for the year, this is gonna fill out for you but it gives you an idea of, am I within that 75% limit that Century Code is talking about? Line three then is gonna add those items together to give you your total appropriations and cash reserve. Again, this is what you need to have in total resources for the year to be able to provide those types of services that you're budgeting for. Um, you have in row four, or the next session section talks about your resources that you have. So line four is your cash and investments. And this is going to be, so I think in this case, this budget file is for 2023. The cash and investments line there is how much cash you're going to have at the end of 2022 that's going to roll in to 2023. So you need to make sure that you're putting an amount in there if you use the, the file or use those extra tabs that are down there at the bottom called G Worksheet 1, G Worksheet 2, uh, which I will talk about here in a little bit, it's going to automatically pull that cash investment number for you. If you have a different estimate that you think is better, I'll, you can feel free to change it. Um, just make sure that whatever you change it to, that you're going to have proper support. Then you're going to have your estimated revenues. And for all these items, whether it's the final appropriation, the budgeted transfers out, the estimated revenue, the estimated transfers in, those are all pulling from these G worksheets down at the bottom right, which again, I'll, I'll go over here in a bit. You'll add those revenues and transfers together. That gives you kind of your total uh, revenue and transfers in that you're gonna have. Then there's a calculation in row six that's gonna tell you what your total resources are. It's gonna tell you what, based on that, what your levy is that you're gonna to require to um, have those kind of expenditures that you're wanting in your budget. And then it gives you that row eight for the allowance for delinquent tax collections. And for a lot of these items in, on, off to the right, 
it gives you okay yep you're within your limitations you're you know you're within that five percent limit if you bump it up to six percent it's going to throw a formula error in there that you're above your limitations uh, so you always want to make sure that you're within and then the nice helpful tool at the bottom is it's going to tell you what your estimated mills are and so if you're within that limitation perfect you're, you're you know one step closer to to being done with the budget process now i will go here next into the actual tab so this is those g worksheets um, there is worksheet tabs for your revenues that you have there's going to be worksheet tabs for the expenditures so for this first part i'll just talk about the the revenue side so you can see here we have different categories you have taxes licenses permits and fees intergovernmental revenues charge for services and so on now if you as an organization have different types of revenues feel free to add more these are just kind of some examples that we we have in the file you just will want to make sure that if you do add more that you update your formulas right now the formulas are are in there that and they're going to be working but if you if you add more rows uh, those can always trigger a formula error so you just want to make sure that you get those updated um, for your revenues you can see that there are three columns one for your actual revenues so again this is a 2023 budget so your actual revenues in that first column to the left are going to be the 2021 actual amounts last year's amounts for 2022 you'll put in what you can either put in what the estimates were from your 2022 budget that you did now you're you know six seven months into the year when you're preparing the next year's budget so maybe you have better estimates maybe you um, collected way more oil and gas revenue that you than you expected when you did the budget last year so you, you can always update those numbers to be more accurate again if you're updating those numbers just make sure you have some kind of support for why they differed from the, the budget that you had in the year before and then for the far column to the right that's going to be your revenues for 2023 that you're expecting and you want to make sure that you do include any type of revenue that you're expecting to receive I mean, those could be various grants they could be the you, you don't want to put in the property tax number there's a up at the top that first line for general property taxes you don't put anything in there because that's what's going to be calculated at the end for you um, but any other type of revenue whether that's you know oil and gas money or state aid make sure you put those in your budget oh, i'll go back here for just a second at the very bottom right then it's going to calculate your total revenue and that total revenue dollar is going to go back to your G1 worksheet and that total revenue line. Here I've got three different tabs for expenditures. Now for the general fund, you have a lot of different categories. You're going to have your general government type expenditures. Uh, if you have public safety expenditures coming out of your general fund, you want to make sure you separate those categories. Uh, so on and so forth and then you'll put in just like you did for the revenues put in your actual expenditures from 2021 put in those estimated expenditures for 2022 and then you, you'd have a column there for the requested 2023 and you'll see there is an extra one for your final appropriation that's what you're actually the, the board has approved to be in your final budget so you'd have a column for that and then down at the bottom right over on G worksheet five it's going to have a line there towards the bottom it's not totally towards the bottom or not totally at the bottom but that total appropriation line so it's going to calculate all those expenditures that you put in if you add different categories double check that formula just to make sure everything's getting pulled in as it should if you don't add any categories it should work just fine it's going to tell you how much your revenues are under or over your expenditures that you're budgeting for and then you have a line there for balance january 1. so in that first column in the actual column that's where you're going to put your actual fund balance as of january 1 of 2021 and it's going to calculate for you then what your actual fund balance is at the end of 2021 there's a formula in there that's going to pull that balance into your beginning 2022 
and it continues to do that all the way to the end where it gives you that that fund balance at the end of December 31st for 2023. There's also rows in there for transfers in and out. Don't forget to fill those in um, if you are going to budget for transfers. So coming back to the to the worksheet here, all these items are going to pull from those worksheets. So your final appropriation is going to come from that tab that I just was on. The transfers out are going to pull. Same thing with the revenues. You're going to end up getting to that estimated mills. Now, if this was just for the general fund, you should there should be a, a in these files a tab for special revenue funds too. So make sure that you do this for each special revenue fund. The special revenue funds typically are a little bit easier to budget for. You just don't have as many expenditure categories or revenue categories for those. So they're a little bit quicker to get through. And you wanna make sure that you do this for your general fund, your special revenue funds, your debt service funds. And then I believe for counties, there are some tabs in here too. If you are say levying for on behalf of another organization, or maybe you have a fund that is a special revenue fund, you're not collecting taxes for it because it's not one that you're allowed to collect taxes. You still have to do a budget for it because Century Code says you need to have a budget for each special revenue fund, but it will um, be there for you. It just isn't going to it isn't going to tell you what your estimated mills are because you're you're not going to collect anything for those. If you have any questions on this budget file. Feel free to ask at any time. Uh, you can always reach out to our office or ask during the during the Q&A session. So next I'll go into some some common issues that we've seen. During the budgeting process, one of those is the interim fund too, is too high. You know, we've seen it where it's 100 percent, 200 percent, 300 percent and so on. You can keep going. Um, State law is requiring us or requiring you to make sure that's not over that 75% rule because that's going to affect how much tax is collected. You don't want that rule is in place so that you don't have this big reserve that you're just building on and building on and building on and never spending it down and you keep collecting taxes. Um, it, it, that rule is there just to you know give you a little a little leeway, a little reserve just in case something happens during the year. Because really, when you do the budget, it, you're budgeting for what's going to happen next year. So you want to make sure that that's really kind of the cash that, that you're going to have it at the end of the year. Then we've seen where the transfers don't balance. Well, the problem there is that, you know, in any transaction, if you do a transfer from one fund to another, those transfers should equal. So it should be the same in your budget file. If you're going to transfer money out of the general fund and into some kind of special revenue fund or a capital project fund or a debt service fund. You just want to make sure that whatever you're budgeting for is transfers out out of all funds that you have the corresponding amount as your transfers in. Now, if you are budgeting for amounts out of the general fund, say to a capital project fund, but you're not budgeting for the capital project fund, yes, your overall budget file that you've created the transfers aren't going to balance, but as long as you have that support for, hey, we're budgeting this amount for a capital project purpose, then you're going to be OK. Number three there is estimated year end cash. We've definitely seen over the past couple of years where entities are putting nothing. They're putting zero as their estimated year end cash when they definitely have cash that's going to be there at the end of the year. If you use our budget file, it's going to, you know, calculate that amount for you. And so you want to make sure that if you don't use the file that you do put in your budget, the estimated cash that you think you're going to have at year end and that you have support for that amount. And number four is lack of support. We've seen it time and time again where there's numbers that are in the budget file, but there's no support whatsoever. Um, you want to make sure for anything that you're putting in there that you've got some kind of support for the budget so that if people come and ask, how did you come up with this? You can say, here, here you go. This is, this is how we came up with those amounts. And then number five is entities aren't preparing a budget at all. Now, the one issue I think with this, if you don't prepare a budget, is one, there's not much for accountability as far as what you're going to spend the money on for the year. You're just asking for that maximum levy perhaps 
Um, I believe in Century Code, it actually even talk about if you don't submit a budget and if you don't, or if you don't submit a budget on time, you actually can't collect more taxes than you did the year before. You're capped out. So you just always want to make sure that you that you do a budget. Um, that way you don't get into any kind of trouble. So a couple of budget tips. Number one is for your starting point for that first year, make sure you're using your actuals. If you put your actuals in there, it's going to just give you a good starting point for perhaps what your expenditures are going to be, what your revenues are going to be, um, and it's going to make sure you're in compliance with the with the century code as well. But one one way that I think anyway that is can be considered adequate support is if you have you're estimating your expenditures for next year. Well, if they're if those expenditures are kind of in line with your actual amounts from last year and they're in line with you know what you're budgeting for in the current year, that to me can be considered adequate support. I mean, you've got you've got history there to show that this is kind of what our expenses expenses are. You know, maybe your supplies don't change much from one year to the next. You know, you're not going to have this detailed list necessarily of all the supplies that you're going to need to buy next year. So you kind of budget for a for a set amount, but if you have that historical data to show, hey, we we kind of spend $10,000 a year on supplies and you put that in your budget, that's going to be um, sufficient support. But if you go and budget, you know, Two million dollars for something, and historically you've only been spending hundred thousand. There really should be support there for how you came up with that two million dollars. Um, and if you can show the auditor that, or show your com board commissioners that, or the citizens that come in, um, that's really going to help you out. Review the budget for all elements. You know, eleven twenty three oh two has all those elements that need to be in your budget if you're a county. Um, but if you're a city, those elements are really about the same. And so if you use the file that's on our website, it's going to have all those elements. If you do your budget in a different way, maybe it's in your own software that you have, just make sure you take a peek at that at the end or even while you're doing it to make sure you have all those various elements in there. Ensure your transfers balance. Double check your formulas at the end. If you take the file that's just on the website, and don't modify it, those formulas should be working for you, but it's still always good to double check. Um, human error is always possible, so you want to make sure that you've you got those formulas in there and that you, you double check those to make sure they're pulling all the expenditures in, all the revenues in, um, and it's just good to do a one final check before you submit that budget to the board. Ensure your support for estimated cash agrees to the budget. Um, here again, if you use the file that we provide on our website, you're going to have this. It's going to be there. But if you deviate from our from our file, just make sure you have that support. And you're going to see a lot of these uh, budget tips that I have. They kind of go back to using our file. Check that interim fund calculation. If you use our file, the, the formula is there. It's going to tell you if you're within the 75%. If you want to do it on your own, that's fine. Just kind of do a 75% calculation up for yourself to make sure that you're in compliance. Work with your department heads. You know, they're going to be some of the best that are going to know what the expenses are for them that they're going to have in the upcoming uh, in the upcoming year. So work with them while you're doing your budget. Don't put it all on yourself. And that'll help you out in the long run. At the end, review the revenues and expenditures that you're putting in the budget. Make sure they all make sense. You know, double check it, make sure you didn't miss anything. And then the last tip that I can give you is use the budget file that we provide because that's going to have all those elements in there and it should really help your organization out. So one of those things that I was going to talk about towards the end here was the capital project fund. You don't have to budget for it because a lot of times, you know, capital projects, they can be tough to know when the expenses are exactly going to occur. Projects get delayed, those types of things. And so if you end up budgeting for a project, say out of your general fund or maybe your road and bridge fund, and that project doesn't happen like you expected it, what you can do is transfer that money out of those funds 
into a capital project fund. Um, you can have as really as many capital project funds as your organization wants, but that helps if you put that money, transfer that money out. One, it gets it so that the expenditures that you budgeted for, for that, you don't have to budget for it again the next year and you move that cash out. If you don't move the cash out, that's going to have an effect on how much cash is sitting in your general fund and you're almost going to have to budget for it again. Otherwise, you're going to have the risk of being over that 75% um, cash reserve. The other nice thing with the capital project fund is once you move that money in there, you can kind of spend it as those projects actually are getting done. You know, once you finally get those preliminary engineering agreements and you start working on those projects and maybe they take a year or two, well, there the money is already sitting there and you can spend it as you need. Now, we always recommend that if you are going to move this money to a capital project fund, that you have a plan for it, that the board commits those funds to be used on said project. We don't want you to just move money into a capital project fund just to have it sit there. That's not the intent of a capital project fund. So you just want to make sure that you um, have the board commit those funds into those into those uh, into those funds to make sure that you have you're ready for those capital projects when they come due. Let's see. Is there any questions, Emily? Yeah, thanks so much. We're just going through the questions that are coming in. Um, when you do a budget amendment, is that by line or by fund? Typically, we like to see that at least the whole, the fund as a whole is not overspent. You can always do a budget amendment if a single line item is overspent, but if the whole, if the fund as a whole is not overspent, to us, it's not a requirement that you um, do that budget amendment, but you are always welcome to do so. OK, there's a question about if the slides uh, displayed will be available to share, and they are presently on our website. If you go to the right hand of the website on the header, there is a drop down called Audit Summit, and in the middle of the page, there are downloadable slides you can click on and download. Another question, Alex, is, is there any way to view sections at a later date if we get called away? Um, yes, absolutely. We will be posting these recordings uh, as soon as they're completed. So most likely um, the next couple of days here, we will have them available on our website, on social media, um, and then also on our YouTube channel. A question that came in is, do you recommend that clients use a special revenue fund sheet for the recent ARPA monies that we received. So if you're talking about putting, I we recommend for sure that you put these American Rescue Plan dollars into a separate fund, not just in a separate account code within your general fund, put them actually into a separate fund because those, those funds are restricted um, by the federal program. So as long as you put them in there, you can then have, when it comes time to do your budget, um, that's gonna be a non-levy fund so you can budget, do your budget based on what you think your expenses are going to be out of the American Rescue Plan Fund, and you should be good. Thank you, Alex. Another question is, is it OK to have a depreciation expense line item based on the value of the fixed asset? And then also acceptable depreciation percentage. I don't think you would want to put depreciation expense into your budget because your budget's really based on what kind of money is going to be flowing out for the year. Depreciation expense isn't a cash transaction, so I would recommend not putting a depreciation expense into your budget. Is there a reason why the park budget file does not show the mill levy? I think the park budget file is still one on our website that we just need to do a couple of tweaks to. I know Heath has done a lot of work on getting the, the county and the city file up to our newest format, the park district file, I think is still on kind of our old format that we had, but we will be getting that updated shortly. Thank you, Alex. Uh, to keep your interim fund under the 75% line, can your board transfer from the general fund to something like a sewer fund 
in anticipation of upcoming sewer expenses that were will be over and above sewer revenues. You know, that one I will take a peek at and then I'll get back to you guys on the question and answer session this afternoon. All right, uh, what happens with the budget after the county auditor receives it? Does the county forward it to the state? Um, as far as I'm aware, the state does not get that budget file. The only time, like at least for us, when we're the come in and if we're the entity's auditor, we just ask entity straight up for their budget. Um, if you have a different auditor, they might ask you for your budget, but the budget itself does not come to us unless we ask for it. Great, and thank you for the questions that you're submitting. Feel free to pop those questions in the chat window and we can get them taken care of. Uh, another question, Alex, is what type of items can a capital improvement fund be used for? Oh, I mean, there's various. Um, if it's some kind of long-term project, put it in a capital project fund. You know, it could be a road project, um, a building project, anything that's going to have really to do with construction that's going to take some time. Um, if it's going to be a capital asset, that's kind of where that capital project fund can be used for. All right, and that presently concludes the questions that we have from online attendees. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for uh, participating today. I hope you find this information useful to you and your organization. And if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to enter them into the chat and we'll get back to them at the Q&A session this afternoon. Otherwise, just keep swimming.